Good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good night even, um, everyone, depending on where you're joining from um, around the world. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm Daniel Morgenstern. I'm a pediatric oncologist working in Toronto in Canada. Um, as you may be able to tell from my accent, I originally grew up and trained in um, the UK, so I have a little bit of experience of um, both sides of the pond, um, but now here working in, in Canada, and I co-lead our neuroblastoma service um, at Sick Kids, and also look after our early phase trial program. Um, and I've been involved in this meeting over a number of years, so it's a real pleasure to be back with you for the third um, online global neuroblastoma symposium. Um, I want to welcome you all on behalf of the um, two sponsors that we have. Um, these are Solving Kids Cancer UK and Solving Kids Cancer um, in the US. And I just want to kind of say at the start, congratulations to the um, team working for those charities, uh, especially Claire Hislop and uh, Leona Knox in putting together such an excellent program as we'll talk about in a minute. The speakers you're gonna hear later today are really um, top quality um, global experts in their field. And it's actually amazing the quality of the speakers that we have for this meeting. Um, in the meantime, you have to deal with me, but later on you'll get some, uh, some impressive speakers. Um, also want to mention the supporters of this um, meeting, um, YMABS, Norgene, Sanofi, Yusa Pharma, United Therapeutics, uh, and GRC World Forums, who are providing the technical expertise behind this um, platform that we're going to be using throughout the day. Um, so they've really helped to make this meeting possible from a financial point of view. Many thanks to them. And of course, I just want to say thank you and welcome to all of you, the participants. Um, I think we've got nearly 400 people signed up from around the world for this meeting. So it's really amazing that the, um, the virtual technology that we've now all become so used to allows us to bring people together from, from around the world, something we maybe couldn't achieve with, a, with an in-person meeting. Um, I want to welcome all of the panelists, uh, all of the speakers, all of the moderators that you'll hear um, later on in the day. Um, and many thanks to all of those. Um, this is a slide to mention the speakers, which I've just done. This is the platform that I think if you're listening to this, hopefully you're already um, aware of because this is how you've, you've got here. And I just wanted to um, flag up on here that a lot of these talks um, that we're going to give today and from previous meetings are all going to be recorded or are already recorded and are available online. So um, today's meeting is, is down to a one day meeting just to make it a bit more manageable for people to join. And so, of course, there's a limit to the breadth of what we can cover. But many of the topics that uh, you may be interested in, even if they're not covered today, have been covered very recently, for instance, last year. And those talks, those videos are available online through this, um, through this website. So there's an extensive um, video collection um, that you can go back uh, and review after this meeting if you're not able to join things live during this meeting. Uh, I've been asked to mention this hashtag. Um, given how much Twitter has been in the news, I won't pretend this year to not know what a, what a hashtag is, but this is the hashtag uh, MPGS2022. Uh, and hopefully this uh, Twitter will still be um, online uh, throughout this meeting. Obviously, it's going through some, uh, some challenges at the moment, but hopefully with hashtags will still be, um, still be relevant and, and useful. So what are we going to hear about during the um, meeting today? And really, this meeting has been designed to focus on the latest developments in research relating specifically to high-risk neuroblastoma. Uh, and there's kind of a total of four big themes and sessions throughout the day. Um, I'm going to give an introduction to neuroblastoma in just a, a moment, just to sort of set the scene about where we're at at the moment. And then there's a session about the challenges of curing high-risk neuroblastoma, what we can do to improve our treatments uh, and how we can overcome those challenges. Uh, there's a subsequently a session on CAR T cell therapies, of course, a very uh, exciting new way of treating neuroblastoma uh, that uh, is just kind of being developed at the moment. There's a session on anti-GD2 antibody immunotherapy. Um, many people will be familiar with using the antibodies as part of um, treatment, uh, but we're increasingly using those in different settings. And we'll talk about how those can be uh, maybe used and adapted more in the future. And then finally, there's a, a very important um, parent perspective on post-treatment, because we know that unfortunately, with all of the therapies that children go through for high-risk neuroblastoma, they do end up with significant long-term effects in many, in many cases. And it's important um, that we recognize those and talk about um, ways of, um, of managing that. So with that kind of rapid fire introduction, I want to, um, to the meeting, I want to move on um, straight away to kind of give an introduction to 
treating high-risk neuroblastoma. Uh, and just to kind of set the scene about neuroblastoma, give a little bit of an indication, where are we now, just to kind of set the stage for the, um, for the scientific talks, the research talks that will come after this. Uh, these are my um, disclosures. And so I just want to give an introduction by saying, you know, what, what are we actually talking about here and what does this name neuroblastoma mean? And I think it's actually really useful to understand that because it helps to just get to the heart of what we're dealing with here. Uh, on the right hand side, I've listed the most common cancers in adults. And you'll see that these all end in carcinoma, that that's a particular type of cancer, a particular type of cancer that's arisen from um, what's called epithelial cells, cells that are damaged over time by smoking or other environmental exposures. But the it, diseases that children get that are listed on the left are not carcinomas, they're something else called blastomas. And that's because they derive from very primitive cells. That's what blast means. And if you look at them under the microscope, which is what that picture on the bottom left is, they just look like nondescript, small, round, blue cells, which is actually what we call them, because they haven't turned into anything else yet. They're very primitive. And of course, for neuroblastoma, the neuro bit does not mean that this has come from the brain, but it does mean that it's come from neuro, from peripheral nervous um, tissue, especially this sympathetic chain. So the sympathetic chain is this bundle of nerves that runs up and down either side of the spine. And then there's a large clump of that nervous tissue sitting on top of each kidney called the adrenal gland. And that's the gland that makes hormones like adrenaline or epinephrine, depending on which side of the Atlantic you're on. That's what makes you feel stressed and anxious. Uh, and neuroblastoma arises because of cells that are going to develop into this sympathetic chain that somehow during development become abnormal and start to grow and proliferate out of control to cause a, a tumor. What makes neuroblastoma a cancer as compared to a tumor? Well, it's the ability of neuroblastoma to spread elsewhere in the body. And this is an MIBD scan that many of you will, will know about showing disease that is spread elsewhere in the body, especially to the bones. And of course, it can also spread to the bone marrow and it can spread to many other parts of the body as well. And it's the fact that neuroblastoma very often spreads to other parts of the body, even at the very beginning when we first detect it, that is one of the reasons why it's so challenging to treat, because we then have to tackle the disease wherever it is in the body and get rid of absolutely every cancer cell throughout the body if we're going to achieve a cure. It's not good enough just to take out the lump of tumor that we can see. Just to give a context about kind of neuroblastoma, how common it is, how rare it is, this is just some, some numbers suggesting the annual number of cases of neuroblastoma in Europe around 900 and in North America, a similar number around 800 um, and then numbers for Japan and, and Australia. And of course, there's huge parts of the world here where I've got no numbers. Uh, and clearly there are a lot of patients um, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, elsewhere in Asia and South America um, that have neuroblastoma as well. And frankly, we don't have you know, good access to treatments for those patients at all. Who gets neuroblastoma? Well, really it's a disease of young children. So this figure here shows how many cases you would expect dependent on age. And you can see that the vast, vast, vast majority of cases, patients are young under the age of five. And actually it's most common in newborn babies and then gradually declines over time. A lot of these neuroblastomas in the very young babies will be localized tumors that maybe can be observed, don't need uh, extensive treatment. Um, and some of these older patients unfortunately have high risk disease. International collaboration for neuroblastoma and other childhood cancers is really critical. And I think this meeting will kind of help to emphasize that neuroblastoma is really a global community, certainly from the academic um, perspective. Uh, and this is just to kind of highlight why we need that global collaboration, really because neuroblastoma is so incredibly rare in the, in the bigger picture of cancer. So these are the most common cancers that adults get in blue. And this little tiny red bar down here is the number of cases of all cancers in children. So a really tiny number compared to adult cancers. And if we then expand that number of all childhood cancers, not all of these are neuroblastoma, of course. So neuroblastoma is, as we like to say, the most common extracranial, so not in the head, solid tumor in children, but it's still only a small proportion of all childhood cancers. And so we might expect maybe 100 cases a year in the UK, 80 or so in, in Canada, um, 60 or so in Canada, and half of those patients will have high-risk disease, maybe half of those patients might have relapse disease. And so when we're thinking about clinical trials for neuroblastoma, 
it's very hard to do those studies just in one country because there are never enough patients to really be able to learn about new therapies. And that's where international collaboration is, is critical. Why do children get neuroblastoma? And this is a question that you know parents ask very commonly because of course it's an excellent question. And we really do not have a very good answer for it. I think my slightly hand wavy answer is just to kind of highlight that in general, cancers in children are fundamentally different from cancers in adults. So they're not caused by smoking. They're not caused by damage from the environment. They must somehow be caused by something that's gone wrong during development. And the fact that neuroblastoma occurs most commonly in young children makes sense if you think about it being an abnormality of development. And I think what's quite striking, if you think about how a baby is put together from the very earliest stage, that you start with just one cell and clearly those cells then have got to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow because ultimately you've got to make the whole of a, of a fetus, the whole of an embryo, and then you've got to make the organs with inside it, you've got to make all of the structures. And so that cell, that cell growth, that cell proliferation is very similar to the growth that occurs in a cancer. And obviously in a cancer, it, can, it happens in an uncontrolled way and during the development of the embryo or the fetus, it happens in a controlled fashion. So most likely there's something that goes wrong in that process of building the baby, building the fetus, such that the cells no longer know when to stop growing or when to stop migrating, moving about the, um, the body and carry on doing that. And that's what turns it into a cancer. There must be at some root an underlying gene abnormality somewhere that triggers this change. We don't really know what that is. Um, this complicated figure here is just to say there are some very, very, very rarely occurring um, families that have inherited neuroblastoma. So where grandfathers had neuroblastoma, mom or dad's had neuroblastoma, and then the patient that you have in front of you has neuroblastoma. Incredibly rare. But in those families, we know that there are a couple of genes that if they're abnormal in the germline. So that means in the patient themselves, I'm not talking about abnormalities in the tumor. I'm talking about abnormalities in the patient's genes, then that predisposes to neuroblastoma. But really, that's very rare. And then there's this whole bunch of other genes where we know that abnormalities of these genes is associated with a little tiny bit of an increased risk of neuroblastoma. But we don't really know how to interpret that. So to all intents and purposes, most neuroblastoma cases are what we call sporadic, which means that they occur out of the blue, we don't know why. And to be honest, although it must somehow be something to do with development, we don't really understand exactly what that process is. Clearly, it, neuroblastoma is not all the same. And this is one of the most complicated things about neuroblastoma is that although we use the same word for neuroblastoma all the time, actually the experience of neuroblastoma in, for instance, a young baby with an isolated single mass in their adrenal gland is completely different from high risk metastatic neuroblastoma in an older patient. And that's reflected on this graph, which is a little bit old now in terms of the um, where the lines are, but essentially is to say there are patients with lower intermediate risk neuroblastoma who generally have a really pretty good long term outcome um, with relatively minimal treatment compared to patients with high risk neuroblastoma who we treat very intensively. And I think, you know, survivals have improved a lot even compared to this graph here, but clearly we are still struggling to treat successfully all of those patients. And so by and large, this meeting will focus on those patients with high risk neuroblastoma because it's really those patients who have the most complicated treatment. And I think at the moment, the greatest need for us to try and find some way of improving outcomes and reducing toxicities. So this kind of risk stratification can get extremely complicated, but to all intents and purposes, I think the easiest way to think about it is there are patients with high risk disease who need intensive treatment, which we'll talk about in a minute, and then patients who have non high risk disease, who then have a variety of different treatments depending on exactly the risk factors in that individual patient. And so for patients with high risk disease, it's about really trying to treat as intensively as possible to get control of the disease and to stop it from coming back. Whereas for patients with non high risk disease, it's about trying to adjust the treatment to what each individual patient needs. Some important messages. 
we are improving the outcomes for patients with neuroblastoma over time. So this figure shows um, the proportion of patients who are surviving over time. So this is when all patients are diagnosed. So when all patients are diagnosed, clearly all of them are alive and well at that point. And then sadly, over time, these curves drop down because the proportion of patients who are surviving gets smaller as on sadly patients recur or die from their disease. And so the lower down these curves, the worse the outcomes are. And you can see that over time from the 1990s, 95, 2000, 2005, these curves are moving upwards. And that means that we are achieving cure, long-term uh, survival for more of those patients. But clearly there's a big gap between up here, 100% cure and where we are in reality. So a lot more still to be done. I don't have time to go into in detail now, but it's important to remember that even though we split between high-risk neuroblastoma and not high-risk neuroblastoma, not all the high-risk neuroblastoma is the same. And we're not great at taking that into account and adjusting treatment at the moment, but we know that patients who have localized high-risk neuroblastoma do have a better outcome than if it's metastatic, which means if it's spread around the body. And we know that in general, patients who are younger have a better outcome than patients who are older with neuroblastoma. And finally, another kind of key important message is the individual risk of an outcome for a patient changes as they go through treatment. That's because if the disease responds as we want it to during treatment, the chances of a good long-term outcome improves. And unfortunately, the opposite is also true, which is that if the disease does not respond as we wanted to, to each individual stage of treatment, then the likelihood of a good long-term outcome is poorer. And so if you're having conversations with your medical team about numbers, if you're a family who likes to know about numbers, it's important to bear in mind that the numbers will change over time, depending on whether we talk about this on day one, when the patient is first diagnosed, or at the end of induction chemotherapy, when maybe the disease has responded really well to induction, or at the end of treatment, or at the, you know, even after the end of treatment. And this is really important to bear in mind if any of you are gonna look at um, publications and look at individual um, survival rates that says three-year survival rate was this, or three-year survival rate was that. What really matters is three-year survival rate from when? Was that from diagnosis? Was that from later in treatment? Was that from the end of treatment. So let's just talk about the current treatment for high-risk neuromastoma to try to set the scene for everyone and to kind of provide the basis for the talks that are to come. High-risk neuromastoma is, as I've mentioned, very challenging to treat. And so we have a very complicated treatment schedule, which is broadly similar throughout both of the big cooperative groups that I'll talk about in a minute. So we can divide this up depending on how you like to divide things, either into three areas called induction, consolidation, and maintenance, or into five blocks of different treatment. So the initial treatment is chemotherapy, multiple different kinds of chemotherapy drugs to try and get control of the disease, control the metastatic disease, and shrink the primary tumor. Typically, we would then do surgery to take out the main tumor, leaving anything that's spread around the body at that point. Most people would then recommend consolidation with high-dose chemotherapy, which is when we give intensive doses of chemotherapy and we rescue the patient's bone marrow with stem cells that we've collected and stored in the freezer. Radiotherapy is then used after that to treat again the primary site and to get rid of any neuroblastoma cells that are left over from the surgery. And then at the end, immunotherapy to try and mop up any residual neuroblastoma cells that are left at the end. And to provide the background as to how we um, have developed this and uh, how we treat neuroblastoma now, I think it's really useful, depending on where you're based, to know about the kind of global setup. And I'm, apologies to those who are in countries that are not shown here because I just don't have time to cover the entire, the entire globe. But these are kind of the two biggest cooperative groups for childhood cancer and especially for neuroblastoma. So in Europe, there's a group called SIAPEN which really brings together pretty much the whole of Europe 
uh, Israel, Hong Kong, and as well as some sites in Australia and New Zealand. And this is a collaborative network which is specifically focused on neuroblastoma. The N in Cyapen is neuroblastoma. On the other side of the Atlantic, over here in Canada and the US, also some sites in Australia and New Zealand, is this group called the Children's Oncology Group, which is a much bigger structure because it incorporates committees for all of the different types of cancer that children get, leukemia, Wilms tumor, osteosarcoma, and has a neuroblastoma committee within it that also then runs clinical trials. But because neuroblastoma is rare and because there's then a limited number of people who look after neuroblastoma, there's actually very close collaboration between these groups so that we share information between the two groups and we learn from each other as to what each group has learned about the best way to treat neuroblastoma. So what I want to do in the closing minutes of this talk is just to kind of run through um, not this, which is the overview of the different treatment protocols, but just to kind of pick out within the different stages of the treatment what we know at the moment and what are maybe the hot topics that are coming next for these different stages of, of treatment. So the details on here don't matter, but this is just to kind of show that the current treatment protocol in Europe, which is called Cypen High Risk 2, and the current treatment protocol in North America, which is called COG AMBL 1531, are different, but the overall structure is very similar with induction chemotherapy, surgery, which is the red arrow, high dose chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and maintenance. So although the details are different and the questions that are being asked are different, the overall structure is very similar. So let's just run through those different areas um, briefly. Where are we now in terms of induction? So in Europe, the Cyapen group previously did a study comparing this thing called rapid COJEC, which is just the names of drugs and rapid means you give them quickly, with a different type of chemotherapy called modified N7. The details don't, don't matter, but that was a chemo that was used in North America. And that was the last study that was done in, in Europe and showed that the outcomes were broadly similar between the two, but rapid COJEC was better tolerated. In the current study in Europe, we're now comparing rapid COJEC, again, that European standard, against a standard chemotherapy that had used been used in Germany, slightly different chemotherapy medicines, to try and see which of those is the better to use for the future. In addition, we're adding a targeted drug, and I'm sure this will be talked about more later on, this gene called ALK, we're adding a targeted drug specifically for those patients who have ALK mutations. So chemotherapy as well as a targeted drug if the cancer has that particular target. In North America, we have settled on a standard five cycle induction chemotherapy, and the current study is testing if we add MIBG therapy to the induction chemotherapy, does that help to improve the response to treatment and do those patients do better? And in addition, we're also adding this ALK inhibitor drug called lolatinib, the same as the European study. So that's happening in parallel, both at, at groups testing the same thing uh, in parallel. Where are we going next? And this will definitely be discussed, um, I'm sure, later today. One of the big topics is, can we improve the response by adding anti-GD2 immunotherapy into upfront chemotherapy? And another big question is, might there be ways in the future that we could reduce some of the toxicities from induction chemotherapy by somehow beginning to think about changing that induction chemotherapy? Where are we now in terms of surgery? So there's some differences in approach to surgery that in Europe, surgery is typically done at the end of induction chemotherapy when we know what the overall response of the disease is and we'll know what we're doing next in terms of carrying on with high dose chemotherapy or not. Whereas in North America, um, surgery is typically done a little bit earlier in the middle of the chemotherapy, just because it's felt that um, it's easier to do the surgery uh, whilst you've still got more chemotherapy to give afterwards. Um, but both groups would, would, would recommend surgery uh, if possible to resect the primary tumor. High dose chemotherapy is, is obviously a huge topic and we've covered it uh, in detail in previous um, meetings. In uh, Europe, there was previously a study comparing um, different types of, chem of chemotherapy for high dose chemotherapy. And in the current study, they are comparing Bumel, busulfan melphalan standard chemotherapy in Europe against tandem. So that means one and then a second high dose chemotherapy. In North America, using slightly different chemotherapies, we have previously randomized one high-dose chemotherapy against two, 
And so most patients are now receiving tandem high dose chemotherapy as the standard. Europe is asking that question because the chemos in Europe are different. And so what is true in North America may not be true in the European context. What's next for high dose chemotherapy? I think, you know, again, as we've spoken about in the past, there's a lot of interest in the question of, well, do we really still need high dose chemotherapy? Um, could we possibly think about replacing it with something else? If so, what would we replace it with? What patients would we do that for? And at the back of all of that is our real worry about what happens if we actually take away a really important component of treatment and then have less good outcomes. Radiotherapy is used in both sets of protocols. There's a standard approach now in um, North America and in Europe, the current study is asking, should patients who've got residual disease have extra radiotherapy to those sites? And then finally, immunotherapy, at the moment, there's a standard approach for both Cyopen and COG, which is a little bit different just because the antibodies are slightly different on both sides of the Atlantic. But in Europe, using a long-term infusion of denatuximab beta without cytokines, cytokines are medicines that stimulate, boost the immune system. And in North America, we're using denatuximab, very similar as you can imagine to denatuximab beta, but slightly different. And we're using that with GM CSF, a little bit similar to GCSF, designed to stimulate and boost the um, immune system to try and make the antibody work better. Next questions for immunotherapy. It's going to be if we're going to use more antibody earlier on in treatment, it's going to be really interesting to think about is antibody at the end of treatment still going to be helpful? Why does neuroblastoma sometimes become resistant to antibody? Why does the antibody sometimes not work? Are there other treatments that we could add to the antibody to make it work better? Are there other treatments we could use after the antibody immunotherapy to try and stop the neuroblastoma from coming back. So a lot of further questions for us to um, think about. So finally, my kind of take home messages are in the context of this meeting, you're going to hear a lot of different information. And I think it's really important to remember that ultimately every child with neuroblastoma is different. So things that you hear in this meeting apply in general. They don't necessarily apply to your specific disease situation uh, and always be sure to kind of discuss things with your clinician about how things that you may have heard here actually impact for your particular situation. I have to acknowledge that a lot of this is really complicated and it's really complicated for us, the clinicians as well, because the situation keeps changing as we learn more and more about this disease and try and improve how we do things. And I guess my final message to everyone on this meeting is, you know, you've really got the opportunity um, throughout this meeting um, to ask um, questions. So please uh, do that um, through the platform and each person who's leading each meeting will, will uh, explain how to do that. So that was fairly whistle stop uh, and I apologize um, um, for going quite quickly through that, but I just wanted to provide that kind of basic background. Up next, what we're gonna do is really transition into the bulk of the meeting and begin to talk about next the challenges of curing high-risk neuroblastoma. What are the challenges and what are the things that we can do um, about that? And that session is going to be coming up uh, immediately after this one as soon as I stop talking. So stay where you are and we'll be back with you in a moment. Thanks.